The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of Southern Minnesota Beet Sugar Cooperative, a highly sustainable shareholder-driven cooperative that safely produces, processes, and markets sugar while being environmental stewards to ensure future opportunities for its shareholders, employees, and surrounding communities. Additional support by MAPE members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans. And by Ask Me Council 5, a union of 43,000 members who advocate for excellence in public services, dignity in the workplace, and opportunity and prosperity for all working families. Live from St. Paul, we welcome you to another session of Your Legislators, a roundtable discussion featuring state lawmakers answering your questions and discussing important issues affecting the citizens of Minnesota. Join the conversation online on Twitter and Facebook. Now here's your moderator for tonight's program, Barry Anderson. Well, good evening and welcome to Your Legislators. If maybe tonight we say Your Legislator. We'll get to that in just a moment. I'm Jim Thorine and it's my honor and privilege to sit in tonight for Barry. I will return next week as he has for a low these many years. But for to me tonight, a, a, a complete treat and a joy to bring this program to Minnesotans. Yeah, those of you who are familiar with our format full well know that we depend upon your questions, your concerns, and uh, your posturing, if you will. So we can answer questions from the lawmakers who are up the street in St. Paul here uh, making uh, decisions on a daily basis, and the pace hastens, I think. Well, tonight we will be having some people join us in process uh, during the course of the show, but we do have present with us uh, one of our Republican state senators. She is uh, Senator Mary Kiffmeyer. Senator, good evening. Good to be with you, Jim. Well, it's, it's a delight to have you here, and, and as I say, others will join us, I'm sure. But nonetheless, you and I will have a great conversation for an hour well, we will, if they don't. I, I do miss Barry, but it's you've just been a pleasure to talk with. I'm uh, glad to have you here. Well, Barry will be back, and he is the stalwart. I know that. So, uh, but tonight we uh, ask our citizens from Minnesota who view us all over to send the questions. You've got the means of doing it, uh, telephone, you have um, Twitter, you can send um, a message by email, the common means of sending questions, and join us because that is the core of what we do here. Uh, Senator, I might ask you first to describe your district where you live and what are your, your duties here at the legislature? Okay. Well, I come from Big Lake, that's my home, and my district number is Senate District 30. And that includes uh, Big Lake and Elk River in Sherburne County. And then it goes to Wright County across the Mississippi River. And I have out Seago, Albertville, St. Michael, Hanover, and 14 homes in Dayton. <laughs> well, uh, no, I'm not saying that's gerrymandering. It's just a question mark, though. How did that happen? Well, it's because those 14 homes are in the Wright County portion that is across the river. So... It's just, they're in right, uh, it's just the nature of, All right. they naturally um, fit for that reason. On the other hand, it seems like, shouldn't they just go with the rest of Dayton? Yeah, one would wonder, but it is what it is, right? Yes. Well, again, uh, to our audience, thank you for joining us. And again, your questions are always welcomed. But uh, this evening, if we could, uh, Senator, uh, since in your past you have served as Minnesota's Secretary of State, and your uh, committees this year are what? Well, I chair the committee, State Government Policy and Finance and Elections, and then I'm also on Health and Human Services, two different committees, and I'm also on Transportation Policy and Finance. I serve on the Ethics Committee. I chair the Legislative Audit Commission, and so those are the particular areas that I work on this session. Well, even before we get toward the end of the session, when we know it gets really busy, mm -hmm. you're already working from 6 a.m. till 11 p.m., that is the, what the job is. That's what we ran for, and glad to be there and do it. Well, thank you so much again. 
Well, let's start, if we, if we may, with uh, something dealing with elections. We do have a uh, question via Twitter. It comes to us from Jack, and he's asking about, uh, as a matter of fact, he's from Champlin. Um, he's asking about House File 748, Senate File 677. As it's summarized here, it would relate to elections and authorizing individuals under the age of 18 to vote at a primary. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you're an election specialist. Your <laughs> well, I know a little bit about elections, but it's a big field, much bigger than we all know. This one is pretty straightforward. Uh, the Minnesota Constitution you, says you have to be 18 years old to vote in any election. And so that's probably the biggest thing. We got this little sticky thing like the Minnesota Constitution that mm. says you have to be 18 years old to vote. So would it be the intent of this bill then to uh, go to a different lower age and that would have to be a constitutional amendment? Well, if you wanted Yes, you couldn't, you know, the, the law, uh, the Constitution clearly says 18, uh -huh. so to put into place a statute like that that is obviously contrary to the Constitution sure. wouldn't be a good thing to do. And yes, the first thing to do would be, if you wanted to do that, is to change the Constitution. Right. Constitutional amendment placed before the voters of the state. Yes. And then if it passes, somebody lower then than you 18. Would, then you would still, then that would, that would be the one, one avenue, yes. All right. Uh, speaking of elections, and you're on that very important committee, what has bubbled up thus far as the key pieces of legislation dealing with elections processes? Well, it's been interesting uh, this year in regards to elections. Probably something I think the, uh, the folks out there might like to know about. One of the bills that we heard on Tuesday afternoon and uh, will be included in the omnibus election bill is having uniform election days and uniform polling places. That means um, you would have a, a four dates, different dates a year. One of them would be the general election in November. The other one would be on the usual state primary date. Another one maybe in May, and another one could be end of February. But all elections in the state of Minnesota then would occur on one of those four days depending upon the need. Whether you're a school district, a city election, township, uh, they have their own special date, but mm -hmm. they would have that. But in addition to that, those other four dates. And so the big thing also is to establish the polling place locations. So once those are set, they stay the same throughout the year, unless there's an emergency or say, it's a um, had a water problem or an electrical problem and that polling place isn't available. Well, then they should be able to change that location for that kind of cause reason. But otherwise, people would ahead of time, I mean, if there's anything you get a lot of phone calls about in elections, and we had a city elections uh, manager testify, and he said, um, by far and above, people get angry when polling places change. They go here and then they go there. So establishing a uniform election dates ahead of time, you know those dates, and that's enough. And then you have the same polling place for each of those four, other than an emergency or a very special circumstance. That will actually increase voter turnout instead of trying to find your polling place, where do I go, which day is it on, now you can put an ad in your local paper in December and say for next year, these are the four dates, right. these are the locations. And that is what helps to increase voter participation when they have that kind of consistency. Yeah. And that would be the first time in Minnesota. And so far, it's actually going quite well. We're getting a, a quite a bit of support uh, for doing so. We're working with the townships, with the cities, League of Minnesota Cities, with the county organization, with the Secretary of State's office, getting all of their input to make sure administratively it, it works with all the various things we've got going. Well, having spent some time in local government, I'm, I'm fully aware that there are some yes. really strange election occurrences. Uh, townships annually meet in March now, fairly early in March, I think the second, second Tuesday, Tuesday in March. and they have their election and they have their budget setting for the following year. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have cities that typically vote perhaps on either primary day or in November. School boards can be elected at different times. So I can see where from a citizen standpoint, some uniformity would be appreciated. Absolutely, and not only that, I mean, when I have a um, packet of information 
that you flip through it and you see the multitudes, uh, Wednesdays, Thursdays, uh, hours change and all of that, standardizing the hours, the polling places, and the dates, I think, agreed. I think Minnesotans would find that very welcome. Now, again, from a local government perspective, sometimes polling chases, uh, places have to change Absolutely. because of circumstances beyond the local governing uh, bodies control. Right, and we're working out that language in this bill so that um, it works administratively. And with input from the cities, from the counties, everybody like that, we're taking all their input, making sure it works so that they have that flexibility, which is very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, in your committee uh, that you're chairing, mm -hmm. uh, what other issues have come to the fore and where do you see them going once we get some numbers next week on our budget. That's, That's right. another whole topic. Yes. So I have a, a finance committee, state government finance committee. Mm -hmm. So I actually have the Department of Revenue, the Department of Administration. I have the MINUT, the Central IT Department of the State of Minnesota, Minnesota Historical Society. Uh, we also have Minnesota Management and Budget, as well as uh, numerous other, all the councils, uh, minority councils, many legislative uh, the Legislative Coordinating Commission, a variety of those. And so each one of those are presenting their budget. Mm -hmm. uh, we review that information, and but everybody's waiting. The forecast comes next Tuesday, yep. uh, February 28th. That is a big deal. Everybody's really waiting for that projection. All right. Well, indeed, up, up till this point, and there seems to be some pretty good movement to get bills moving through the process. Mm -hmm. But we still don't know really the true number that you're going to rely on for that budget right. for next year. Once you get that number, mm -hmm. then after that, other things happen and flow down from that. But I would say we did a wonderful job right away in the beginning of session in, in the matter of the first few weeks. We passed out Senate File 1 which had to do with some very important premium relief for the individual market health care premium relief right. who were hit very, very difficult. We also put in place seven reforms. So we advanced Minnesota's health care by including premium relief and those seven reforms, allowing for-profit companies to sell insurance in Minnesota. There's some places in Minnesota that have only one insurance company that will sell a product for, for them. No competition, prices are skyrocketing. You bring in some competition, you help lower prices. Now we have a bill that we're also coming out with an additional one, and that is for the high risk pool that Minnesota used to have. They had that. When Obamacare came in, that was thrown out, could no longer have that. And that has triggered a cascade of really serious consequences that have really been painful for Minnesotans in the insurance area. Really sad to see some of the people who have put in a foreclosure, bankruptcy, uh, actually saying, I just can't afford it, so now they have no insurance, when the whole thing was to help them get insurance. Right. It actually worked the opposite, as the governor said, it had become unaffordable. Uh, Senator, I know that uh, there are the Democratic approaches, the Republican approaches, but from your side of the aisle, to what degree is Minnesota's answers for our problems linked to the federal health plan? Well, Minnesota had a very, very good system. We had the Minnesota Comprehensive Health Care Association that took care of the high-risk pool, mm -hmm. subsidized by the people of Minnesota, structured very well, worked very well. Looks like the feds are going to go that route as well as one of their reform, uh, to repeal and replace one of their reforms, mm -hmm. modeling after Minnesota. So I think that there are, uh, when Obamacare came in, Minnesota, all these things that we had in place were just dramatically either made in, unable to be functioning. The other thing is the whole Minsure, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars spent on software that is really not working. Lots of money, there are issues with that. There are just numerous ones that it's really sad to see. Minnesota was very proactive, very diligent, very compassionate, did a lot of good things. And then with one stroke from Washington, wiped all of that out and just put us in a very serious position. But, you know, we'll work together. So Senate File 1 did a lot of good things. We're going to continue to do some more. In addition, we did federal tax conformity. We did that. It was $21 million of relief for Minnesotans. But the big thing is we got it done before stack tax season started. So all the accountants who have emailed and said, thank you, thank you for getting it done. 
while we are doing the income tax of Minnesotans, so we can, it's built into the software and different programs that they use. That's really a good thing. So that was a great start. We passed the Rural Financing Authority, a loan program for rural Minnesota in particular that enables them to get low cost loans and it's a revolving fund, they pay them back, has a 1% default rate. So it's a very solid program. This is directed at uh, small businesses or co-ops? Farmers. Or farmers. Farmers in okay. particular. And the young farmers these days, because of the estate taxes, which are so high, many times when they inherit a farm, they have to sell a piece of the farm in order to afford to keep the rest of the farm. Mm -hmm. That makes it very hard to have the size that they need to make farming work for them to be successful. Yeah. With these loans, it helps especially young farmers get a start in the business, not have to sell a piece of the farm, and able to make a go of it in a small farm. For many farmers today, perhaps most, 240 acres just won't do it unless you are a niche farmer. And there are those who do it very well. Mm -hmm. uh, just a reminder to our audience that you are joining us tonight, as many of you do on Thursday nights for your legislators. Tonight we are speaking with our legislator of the moment, <laughs> Senator Mary Kiffmeyer I'm from Big Lake. I'm certainly hoping I so miss my colleagues being here. There's such a wonderful dynamic when you have Democrats and Republicans and we all Yes, we like that. And, and it just and feels like we're missing. Well, I hope maybe we, some we of are. So, come. Uh, no, I'll, I'll still be the moderator. Okay. We'll have to wait for the others to join us. Okay. But we do have, uh, we understand the House ran into a late session, and we're hopeful that they'll join us uh, shortly um, and be with us for the balance of the uh, program. And again, a reminder to our viewers, uh, join us with your questions via Twitter, uh, via the telephone, uh, get online, and send your questions to us. We'll bring them along for at this moment and for the foreseeable minutes to share them with Senator Mary Kiffmeyer. Um, one of the questions that did come in, and uh, this goes over to perhaps somebody who would be on the other side of the aisle, I'm going to presume, but the question comes from uh, uh, Todd County, I believe. Uh, why can't the legislature come to an agreement to have a single-payer health insurance plan? And then he goes on to cite certain what he believes to be or she believes to be shortcomings in our system today. But that's a great big global picture, single payer versus what we do now. I don't detect a lot of sentiment in the majority party in the Minnesota House and Senate to move that way. Absolutely not. We believe that um, here in our country, the freedom that we have and the quality of care that we have is greatly benefited from an open market, not government dictated, government run, and all that comes with it. And so uh, we believe, though, that our current health care system um, was very much disrupted by an effort to do a very heavy-handed government approach uh, that didn't work. So getting more government in, I don't think that advances the needs of Minnesotans' health care by going in that direction anymore. And so uh, we're going to give our uh, approach to it an opportunity to succeed and to work, uh, working with the governor and working with input as well from everybody that is willing to help and assist in that regard. But uh, as we've done already with Senate File 1, have implemented some of them, signed by the governor, a Democrat. So I think we're, we're making progress so in that There is regard. some part of bipartisanship as we go through this session thus far. We more than you know, because sometimes the bipartisanship effort we do doesn't make the news. The disagreements do. Oh, yeah, headlines, as a matter of fact, right? <laughs> uh, move on to another topic here, because one of our viewers uh, sends in the question about the care of mental health uh, patients and mental health needs in the state of Minnesota. Uh, the note here is that uh, um, quite a few of our jails serve as sort of a de facto mental health institution, and you can talk to many, I think any sheriff in Minnesota, they'd probably agree. Uh, so given that dire straits of mental health uh, care provision, what do we turn to? What are the answers we can seek? It's multi there are many solutions to this more singular problem, but they're absolutely right that many people, and this is one of the pieces of it, that they are unable to get their medication refilled. 
They can't get in to see the doctor timely or a nurse or a physician assistant or a nurse practitioner because there's kind of a log jam in the, the current situation. And so being able to get their medications renewed timely is a big part of it because when they go off their medications, it triggers a psychotic reaction maybe or an issue or a lack of control. And oftentimes, sometimes that may be when the police are called. And so that's what gets them into that. There's another, uh, so one of the pieces is to help make sure that we have appropriate and sufficient quantity of providers mm -hmm. so that th nobody should be ending up in jail because of a lack of a renewal of a prescription that is much needed. That just should not happen. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure the, the right providers are amply there to take care of them. And I believe we have good Minnesota providers who would do that. We need to get that structure taken care of. And then when they do have a situation where they come in that contact with the police, one of the solutions, one of the bills that's making its way through is where you would have, um, say you come into a situation with the police, often starts there, and they sense or they see that this is more has a mental health, heavy mental health component with it, they would call upon a provider again, but not after they're in jail, but before, and they might divert them then, instead of into jail, take them to a treatment center, yeah. which is where they really need to be, not in a jail. This is a health issue, a mental health issue. Now, if they've committed a crime with a violence, they've hurt someone, sometimes You've just got to have some control first before. So we'll leave that to the judgment of them. That's called kind of a dual track, kind of a dual situation like that. So mm -hmm. instead of getting them in the jail, we, we take care of it ahead of time. Once they are in jail, having health care providers that can meet those needs as well and get them out of that jail. Mm -hmm. And so there are multiple things like that that I think can help the system. A number of years ago, Minnesota moved from the heavy state institutions such as the one that formerly was at Fergus Falls or at Moose Lake and huge institutions. And we moved to community provision of health care services. And there have been those at county levels, at least, that I've spoken to who find that uh, there just aren't enough beds, if you will, in certain uh, sectors of the state. So it would seem to me, at least as one start, would be do we have enough beds? Do we have enough caregivers to meet the need? when they do, for example, get out of jail. I think that is appropriate as well. That is another piece of it. But I always like to go upstream. If it's a medication, get your refill and get it timely, and you don't have to go there, that's the first place to start, to make sure that you do that. And then downstream, if you can't um, take care of it there, then yes, having sufficient beds. And we have expanded already some of that, and there are other proposals as well to expand the availability of the beds. We've got great community providers who have a real heart of compassion to take care of them. Good. We've got a question by uh, Twitter, and I'm going to tell who it's from, I think, MinnesotaBeerActivist.com. I wonder <laughs> what they're asking about. Actually, the, the question to your, our, your legislators, hope you get to Sunday Sales Minnesota tonight. Oh. <laughs> Where are we in the, in the pitch to bring Sunday Sales of uh, liquor beverages to Minnesota? Well, we did a press conference today, and that question came up of the majority leader, uh, Paul Gazelka. Mm -hmm. And so uh, his indication is that it will come to the Senate floor. It's already passed the House. That it will come to the Senate floor. And an educated guess is it appears as though it has the votes. And so the expectation that this is probably the year, if nothing else, everybody's worn down by keeping coming up like a penny that just keeps. And so Sunday sales is like that. It's been very persistent, a lot of support for that. And so his opinion and others uh, that are in the legislature is that it will probably pass the Senate as well. And this year, all you beer activists, uh, all your efforts have uh, paid off, and it looks like you're going to get Sunday sales. All right. So at, at, I don't know what the initial date would be, but perhaps July 1st uh, wouldn't be unusual. That July, is the normal. So the first Sunday in July? Whoopee, right? <laughs> well, at least we can Just stop say. the fleeing over, over to the border to Wisconsin, right. Iowa, South Dakota, North Dakota. Yes. They're all going to live in fear of us <laughs> passing this bill, and that so, is welcome. So the measuring yardstick will be how, how far down do the sales go in our neighboring states, right? Well, and how many do you know that we actually pay our Minnesota cities that are on the border because of the loss of tax revenue? 
we actually, from the state general fund, give them extra money to go into their city budget to allow for that loss of revenue. So maybe we can have a little savings there as well. Now they're yeah. going to get all the revenue themselves. We'll have a big celebration on the on the bridge in Moorhead between Moorhead and Fargo. Okay. <laughs> all right, on to another topic here, uh, Senator, if we might. Um, asking, uh, this is a question from Clear Lake, um, not far not from. Not far from here. Well, is it in your district? No, Clear Lake close. is uh, close, okay. very close. Yes. No, question is, what is your opinion on buffer strips? Uh, that, of course, huge issue in our ag areas. Huge issue, a lot of controversy. Um, it has come up quite a bit. And so, just for some of the viewers who may not know, the buffer strip is you have a, a piece of land, uh, you have the river, and you have the farmland or the residential land, whatever it may be, and then that buffer is that piece of land between the water and uh, that area. And the so actively the goal, farmed area. Yes, yeah. I, and that's mainly, but it, it, this can be lakes, can be lake property, sure. it can be residential property. The big thing there is that runoff into our surface water, whether it's ponds, lakes, rivers, whatever it may be. So it's to try and have a buffer where that water doesn't, where that, um, you might say sometimes it is fertilizer, lawn fertilizer, very of those things, don't flow over the surface and go directly into our rivers or other lakes and things like that. So that buffer strip area, but it's contentious because you have to remember that maybe that can be uh, seen as a really good thing, and it is, but that means the farmer has to give up land that he uses to be able to feed the rest of us. Right. And we kind of like this eating thing. Oh, I know it very well, perhaps too well. <laughs> yes. But you're right. And so there's a, there's a, in the minds of some, at least there's a taking from the farmer That's right. in order to benefit the greater good of society. Mm -hmm. uh, and so how do we justify that land being taken out of production? And oh, by the way, who pays for it? Exactly. Matter of fact, that, that's interesting that as I was preparing for my committee today, I was reading through a bit of the Constitution to freshen up on a bill I was presenting, and I came across a piece that said, you can't take people's land from hmm. government. You can't take their land without just compensation. That's summarizing it, yep. but in essence, that's it. And so if you have a takings of the land, and not only that, the taking of the land, but they also wanted to put on people rules and regulations that mandated expenditures on the land they had left that were very difficult for them. And so those are two issues. And now we agree with the greater good, and the farmers do. They live on the land. Yeah. They care about the land. But they also got to make a living. And so though that's where the buffer comes, the buffer strips yeah. and the issues come. And the legislature is kind of the buffering place where we work that out. Any, any sense from your colleagues, either Republican or Democrat, as to where this might be headed this year? Any major changes you surmise might come about? In this area, it seems as though they're going to be modest changes. I don't know that they'll be very large ones. Some of it is funding to make sure that mm -hmm. we're able to compensate correctly. There are a variety of issues that are going. We're too early in the legislature right now. There are some bills introduced. We know about the issue. We just don't know yet kind of the direction where it's going, especially on something like buffer strips. Well, as you mentioned earlier in the program, we're at a point now where at the end of February, we have a revenue projection, and there, you're going to see some numbers now that are, they may be hard and fast as projections go, mm -hmm. but they do become a touch point for all that proceeds afterward in terms of expenditures, where do we take these monies or where do we save the monies? Do you have any sense from your caucus or from your leadership or that you might have as to what these mon numbers might look like next mm -hmm. week? Well, right now we have a projected $1.4 billion surplus. So we don't know what that's going to be at the end of February. It doesn't look like it's going to differ a huge amount from that. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of an educated guess that I'm hearing from others as well. But you're right, that when we get that budget number, when we get that forecasted number, that is the one we use. Now it can differ later on, go up or down, but for that budgeting cycle, that's the number that we will use and we'll derive all the other uh, points. By the way, I, I wanted to mention though, one of the things we didn't talk about yet was in the taxes, and I just wanted to be sure of that. 
um, there's some interesting things moving through, which also is tied to that number as well. Okay. No, I'm, I'm not going to presume that you're talking additional taxes. No. There might be some on the other side of the aisle who might approach that, but I suspect that won't be your posture, General. No, that won't be mine. No. Uh, as a matter of fact, even the governor has relinquished on the gas tax increase as well, and he's taken that off. So now we're working within the surplus and also um, to make sure we cover roads and bridges and we, we have that the money that is so necessary and so very important. And because the gas tax is a declining revenue raiser anyway because of the more efficient gas cars and then electric, natural gas and other things, we need to broaden those revenues. So using the gas tax we currently have, but then taking auto-related sales tax and rededicating that to a steady stream of income, and that way electric cars will contribute to roads, which they don't use gas. Right. And uh, cars that use uh, natural gas, because repairs you always have, no matter the vehicle, you'll always have the repairs. We do have a few potholes in Minnesota from time to time. We do. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and driving in uh, this evening, as a matter of fact, I, I note that if this time of year, and I'm not blaming MnDOT mm -hmm. or anybody else, but that's the nature of Minnesota weather. Along well, we have comes this our freeze thaw cycle. Yes. Oh, yep. And especially this one where it gets super warm. Amazing. I wore flip flops the other day just for the sheer fun of going outside and. They're not permitted on the Senate floor, are they? No. <laughs> <laughs> but you had a good time. I went outside at home. Okay. Well, let's uh, switch gears again here because now we'll get back to. Uh, one of the areas where you have expertise as a former Secretary of State and working now on Elections Committee. Uh, here's a question from Long Prairie uh, stating that townships are required to use voting machines for all elections uh, when they have over 500 prospective voters. Could that be waived for township elections when they have only 8 to 12 voters in a normal turnout? Uh, I understand that some townships and maybe some counties have gone to mail ballots. Is that a solution? Well, I think I'd like to go back. First of all, they have the current exception for under 500. Okay. okay. So uh, that reasonable kind of approach that we definitely want to take. However, for the townships in particular, you mentioned that number, 14, 16 voters. Mm -hmm. However, I live in a township, and we have eight, 9,000. So not all townships are like that. So to have a blanket exemption for townships in general is not realistic. Is there any number you could get to? Well, the problem we have, though, is that the, the disability community um, has a situation where they want this equipment. And so for them, it's more of an issue as far as having the disability equipment. Now, one of the things, and I, I am meeting with them right now, uh, to talk to them about reasonable accommodations to make sure that we have a balance here of competing interests. And so uh, can we have some work like that going on? Well, Mary, I can give yes. you a break for a while. Yes. <laughs> uh, we want to welcome to the set and to our program tonight Representative Jeff Howell. Uh, Representative, I understand you were working hard I, we, and barely got out of there. We uh, we worked late, so uh, but we've got the we got the business done and and glad to be here. All right, thank you. Now for our viewers tonight, just a brief uh, outline of your district and then some of your legislative responsibilities. Well, I uh, I'm from the Cold Spring, Rockville, Painesville area up by St. Cloud District 13A. Mm -hmm. uh, the district is a lot of uh, farm. Ag uh, resort area, a lot of lakes, and also a lot of granite industry. And uh, so uh, we also have Golden Plump there, so the poultry industry is big. I, uh, I serve on the Civil Law Committee, the Transportation Committee, and uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of the, the other two here. You know, when you're in a rush, you, you kind of forget. You came so. out of full session, not <laughs> yeah, session, So uh, right? uh, uh, let's see, uh, public safety. And uh, what's that fourth one? Uh, we'll gone. look on the calendar and see if you have to be at work at 7 a.m. <laughs> wow, there you go. So uh, I, I'm trying to remember. Let's see, civil law, transportation, public safety, uh, 
Holy smokes, yeah, there's a fourth one. Think of Monday, can't. Tuesday, Wednesday. Okay, well, anyway, anyway, it doesn't make we, any difference. There's legislative uh, work to do, and we know that. We've been talking with the senator about uh, the uh, announced numbers coming up on Tuesday okay. about revenues and where we're at. Um, she offered some perspective. We have new numbers coming out February 28th in terms of our revenues. What do you think we're going to have looking at? What are you going to be looking at? Well, I, I hope that we'll be looking at a similar surplus than we had before, uh, hopefully somewhere at $1.4 billion or above. Uh, but there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of needs. And uh, the, the striking thing that really puzzles you, when you look at the budget, if you don't pass any bills and do anything, the budget's going to increase by $3 billion. Uh, so it's, it's really surprising when you want to hold the line on spending and you want to hold the line on, on, the, uh, on the, the budget numbers to keep us from spending that much money. It's awful difficult when you start looking at the priorities and what you want to do. What, that, those kinds of numbers, even though you're thinking $1.4 billion is a large number, and to me that's a huge number, it still uh, can't keep us at even on our spending. Mm -hmm. Well, Will, uh, we were talking about uh, taxes, and I've got a question from a viewer in Alexandria, and we'll perhaps start with you, Senator Kiffmeyer. Why do VFWs, Lions, Elks uh, all have to pay 44% charitable gambling tax? Uh, well, if I could do it, I'd say they should keep it all. I think charitable gambling done in the local community, the best thing is let them keep 100% of their money because they raise it from amongst themselves. They do good things, whether it's baseball, youth mm -hmm. efforts, their hospitals, their communities. They do such good things with it. Charitable gambling started out that way. That's the way it was. And then the state kind of got their fingers in it. And uh, if I had my way, it should all stay in the local community. All right. And Representative Powell? Well, I would like to see them, you know, we're losing VFWs and those service clubs, we're losing them at a rate of 10 a year. Uh, we need to do whatever we can to try and keep those because they're, they're mainstays of our, our communities. It's where the community, they, they have all kinds of functions there. Uh, I think we ought to cut their property taxes a little bit because they're having a hard time with their membership. Mm -hmm. And when veterans come home, it takes a while. It takes a, mm -hmm. and I'm speaking from experience, it takes you about 10 years to figure out you want to get back with your group again. <laughs> so uh, yeah. we need to give them a little bit of relief in that respect. And I know there's a couple of bills working through on the tax committee to do that. So we'll see where they end up. It, it may, may also be something in the metro area, but I know for sure in outstate Minnesota, how many communities have a solid American Legion baseball team, uh, VFW team, uh, they're playing baseball in the summertime, great youth activities. And they're not inexpensive. And that's what keeps, uh, that's what keeps that youth out of getting, tr getting in trouble, uh, keeping them active. And so they do a lot of great things for our communities, and we need to make sure that we keep those uh, establishments in our, and those pillars of our community around. Yep. Uh, another question that uh, perhaps we'll, uh, well, we'll start with you, Representative Howe. Question uh, comes to us uh, from Royalton, as a matter of fact. Uh, how will the recent state auditor's report impact the funding for home and community-based waivers to increase pay for caregivers working in that industry? And as well you know, that we have thousands of Minnesotans who are angels. Well, that's the way I phrase it. But they're caregivers. So how can we help them? You know, I, I think we, we need to find a way. We took care of the, the nursing home providers, uh, workers uh, before, and now I think we need to find a way to take care of those PCAs and those folks and give them a raise. Uh, it's, it's really tough. Uh, and I think we took care of one segment. We know we need to do something there, and, and if we can give them a 5% raise or whatever we can, uh, we need to look forward to that because they are – you are right. They are angels. They take care of all those folks that, that – and it's much cheaper to do that than it is to put them in the nursing homes and, and, and provide that long-term care. So this is an avenue that we need to, we need to do because it's, it saves money. And as well we know, in many of our smaller communities, that nursing home is a huge employer for that community. And the employer goes – so harmed is the community. Right? Mm -hmm. It's very important because there they are in, in rural Minnesota, one of the mainstay uh, employers okay. out there. You're absolutely correct. Uh, we'll move on to another one. Any comment, uh, Senator? 
No, I think okay. uh, Sen Representative has done well. Very good. We're on target. A uh, question comes to us from the Rushford-Peterson area down in beautiful southeast Minnesota. Uh, the Rushford-Peterson School passed a bond issue and the large majority of the revenue will be paid by farmers already in some financial trouble. So is there anybody in the legis legislature working on how we change who pays when you have a bond issue passed successfully? Well, I can address that issue. The, um, the proposal in the tax bill last year that was vetoed by the governor would have included significant property tax relief for farmers. It would have um, left them paying taxes like anybody else does on their home, their immediate surroundings in general, but they're disproportionately affected in a huge way just because they simply have land. And so that is not really the intention that it's almost taxation without representation because those big areas and hundreds of acres of land don't have a person there uh, to vote in regards to that. So balancing this out by giving some property tax relief was in that bill. I'm anticipating it, it will come forward again this year. I anticipate that too. I think that's what's going to happen. You'll see that same proposal come through the tax bill again. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have some of the farm groups singing in harmony on that particular issue? Oh, yes. Oh, very much so. So <laughs> I, I don't think there's any uh, disagreement that there needs to be. In fact, I think they've uh, got some agreement with the school school boards and the mm -hmm. and folks too. I think that was an agreement last year on that tax bill, and I think uh, that'll go that'll be in the bill again. From a legislator's standpoint, whether Senate or House, uh, when you come in with formally disparate or differing viewpoints from these different organizations and they've come to a common ground, I'm going to presume that makes your job a little easier. No, it makes it a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you've got to find the money, too. You, you do, but, you know, that doesn't always happen and that doesn't always happen overnight. Usually it takes a little while to get to that stage of the game and that, I think mm -hmm. sometimes they look at that and say, well, we'd rather come to an agreement than let the legislature figure it out because we're not always the experts on that. And when they can bring it together, that's uh, much better than us uh, mm -hmm. doing it. Just an offhanded question we were talking about. In this case, the agricultural groups who have representation in the form of some lobbyists and people working on the Hill uh, every day. In your normal work day, you've got your committee meetings, you have your Senate session or your House session. How often in your offices or maybe in the hallways are you uh, foisted upon by one lobbyist or another or somebody with a special interest do you ever have quiet time <laughs> very little quiet time <laughs> no it's it's hard even to try and get a bite to eat we usually have a refrigerator and and uh, we get what we can protein bars or sadly sometimes some pretty pretty icky food but you just it, it's your job and you enjoy mm -hmm. doing it and so whether it's the hallways or inner offices scheduled we know how important it is for people to have access to their legislators and we make way make time and use as many moments of every day to make ourselves available to them and many times we make phone calls afterwards or before you you find yourself you know eating dinner at 10 o'clock you uh, because you need to do work on your bills also so there's not much time uh, when we I usually it's from 7 right straight through and you start on television, go home and have a bite to eat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't. I think I'm going to pass. I'm going to try and get home now. So, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, we'll try to get out of here before the snow flies. Mm -hmm. uh, a question from Appleton, as a matter of fact, uh, and I'm not quite sure. But well, maybe you can take me to the answer. The question is: the 25% refund on health premiums is that retro to January one? Yes, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. And so is, what's the process? Do they automatically get a check in the mail? Or? No, the way, that's, the way it was supposed to work, and I, I assume that's the way it's going to mm -hmm. work when it gets implemented, is that the, they'll actually see that taken off their bill, their invoice from the insurance company, and the, the state will send the insurance company the, the reimbursement for that piece. Okay. So that's how that's supposed to work. They'll, they'll see that right on their invoice. 25% off their uh, their monthly bill. All right. 
Uh, well, I think I'll turn to you, Senator, because of your election background. Oh, yeah. Question here from... <laughs> Jeff, you can... Well, you, no, he will chime in. We'll, we'll, okay. we'll, make, we'll hold him to it. How does that sound? Okay. okay. Uh, the question from Springfield, where is real ID at in our legislative process? What's happening? What, number one, what is a real ID? Oh my, that's a big question. Well, a, a real ID is a, is a federal conforming uh, government actually, identification. A right? federal law, uh, actually. It's right. a federal law. It's yes. a federal law that was enacted in 2005 that said that uh, your driver's licenses should or need to have these components in order to be right. compliant with the federal law. Right. So Minnesota's been working on it for a couple of years? Well, we started working on it last year. Okay. Uh, in fact, in 2009, we were pro there was a bill passed that prohibited the Department of uh, public safety or the legislature for me than discussing it. Hmm. So we repealed that last year so we could have the start of the discussion. We couldn't come to an agreement what should happen with the real ID. The House just passed real ID tonight. So as far as the House goes, our bill it will be sent. It, it, we passed it. it and our bill is a two-track bill uh, proposal. One is a, a real ID, which has conforms to all the, the, uh, the parameters from the federal government. And then there'll be, which is, you can opt to go get one if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there'll be a regular driver's license that you carry today. You can stay with that. So if you want, decide you want the real ID, so you need it to get on an airplane, you need, it, you need a real ID to get into uh, a federal facility, like a military base, Fort Snelling, those types of places, or get on an aircraft. That's going to be required for you to have that January 2018. All right. So you've, the House has now thrown the gauntlet. You've passed the bill. <laughs> goes over to the Senate, right? Well, the Senate's got their own version mm -hmm. going through their ah, process. So I, I, do I hear a compromise? There will be up? a conference committee. Okay. They'll be a very busy. It's very contentious. Uh, the issues are data privacy. Uh, is, your, is your data yours and is it private to you? And then the other thing is that, and the real ID actually, uh, after 9 11, mm -hmm. uh, the awareness that uh, those who came in to harm us used a fake ID and the awareness that our underlying, underlying documentation of birth records and identification were a problem and it made it very easy to get a fake ID and it was used to cause us harm. Mm -hmm. And so that is the, the context by which real ID was passed, requiring verification of your citizenship, verification of your identity and who you are. That's, that's what makes it a real ID. And so the other IDs that we have can also be representative of who you are, but they don't go through some of the verification process. So if I'm going to presume that the law will pass under some compromise, maybe that's a false assumption, but let's say it does. Uh, do I then have the choice of using the real ID thing, or is my passport good enough to go anywhere? Your passport will let you get on a plane and do everything you want. That's kind of a misnomer sometimes that somehow you have to have a real ID or otherwise you can't travel. That is not true. Not all people have been a passport. Matter of fact, do you know what I got on the airplane with what? two weeks ago? My Costco card. I accidentally, <laughs> my own driver's license and credit card slid off my lap as I got out of my car, fortunately in the car, but I got into the airport and realized I don't have my ID with me. And I'm like, what am I going to do? I didn't have the credit card to use it. And so I opened up my wallet and showed the, the person working at the counter, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. And so she said she noticed my Costco card. She said, that'll do because it has your photo on it. I pulled up my Costco card. With that, I got a boarding pass. Then I went to the TSA department. Again, asked for an ID. I don't so have So how long so were you held by a Costco? <laughs> actually, well, actually, it took me about 20, 25 minutes, which is much longer this was in a small airport, so I was kind. They had a lot of time. They went through my, my purse, was totally dumped out. They did everything. I got patted down every which way. But I got on my airplane. I got home. But I almost, the bigger problem is then I couldn't get out of the parking ramp because I didn't have my ID Senator and my credit card. Senator this, this is a TV <laughs> episode. Uh. And so uh, once again, though, 
She asked me, do you have your ID? No, I don't. Do you have your credit card? No, I don't. She looked at me like, lady, mm -hmm. I, I deserved yeah. it. I absolutely deserved it. So I said, will my Costco card work? <laughs> and it did. <laughs> no, I know what happened. Somebody said, well, that's Senator Mary Kiffmeyer. She used to be Secretary of State. She's good. Make trouble for her. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> I think Minnesotans are very kind. I did get out of the parking ramp and paid my proper fee. So there are some options though if you didn't want to get a real ID then it, there's you got the enhanced driver's license that uh, you can pay extra and get but there's only uh, I think there's a dozen places in the state that you can get an enhanced driver's license or you can use your passport the issues with the enhanced driver's license and the passport they all have a chip in them an RFID chip that uh, unless you've got those in a protective sleeve can be read from across they can be read from across the room with a reader and take all your information off. That's it. called a cottage industry, I think. Isn't oh, well, it? It, <laughs> for some, which, which it's not on, legal, but it, which on the real ID, it has no RFID chip. Okay. You can't be read across, and the only information that's on your real ID is the information that's on the front of the card. I'll tell my wife, pack up the passports. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, it sometimes, works. Yeah. absolutely. Okay, um, move along to uh, another uh, question. This from Rochester. Uh, taxes on Social Security income. Are there any bills in the hopper to change our taxation there? Absolutely. It's a matter of how many bills. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and I was chief author of one uh, two years ago um, and received a hearing and favorable, but um, we didn't have a tax bill at all. So those are the issues. But I would say this year there's several both in the House and in the Senate. They're making their way through, have a very positive. It's, it's a fairly uh, pricey affair, so more than likely it would be phased in mm -hmm. um, over a number of years to be able to allow it to mm -hmm. fully come for, in. For our viewers that may not be real familiar with the process, and so they hear several bills are really doing the same thing mm -hmm. in the end, but is it the art to it, or the difference of opinion, or the politics that leads to different versions? Well, there's some of them is are the how you the process of what they want to how they want to achieve it. Some of them are, is, you know, some might take ten years, some might take five years. Who know? You know, there's little different variations, uh, and sometimes it's, uh, you know, who's carrying the other versions of the bill and the process it goes through, but uh, it'll be interesting and to see which ones survive and which ones uh, get accepted into the omnibus bill and how it comes out during conference committee. And, and I would say the fact that there are several is bodes well for it at this time. It may be something that its time has come. Mm -hmm. And so in the end, there'll only be one language in one bill agreed to by both the House and the Senate and when you seek a signature of the governor, agreed to by the governor as well, then that'll be all distilled down through the hearing process into that language. Based on your experience, are you seeing in this session uh, some more harmony? You're getting to some bills that are getting passed and sent on to the governor. Is there conference committees that are ready to dig in and do work now and wait for the great big stuff? on May 20th? Well, we can't quite get there yet to conference committees. We have had two already, Senate File 1, uh, the um, Rural Farm yeah. Authority, also the, uh, there's several of them that have actually gone to the governor for signature that have had conference committees and, and it's looking well. We feel like we've established a pattern, positive pattern of working with the governor, mm -hmm. working through things that you get a few signed and a few more signed. It helps the momentum to go that way. And so I think, but we're at the phase right now. We have the uh, February 28th forecast, then we have the finance bills, and as the tempo goes, week after week after week, mm -hmm. more committees, more bills, and conference committees. The midnight oil start to be burnt here in, in March. That's it, right. uh, we, we will be there late, we'll be there often, and uh, there won't be a lot of time off uh, until we get past those deadlines. Then it'll slow down a little bit. I would say that once we, you know, once we get the budget forecast, we get the the common targets, the the joint targets between the House and Senate. Then we'll work through our finance bills, and then we'll go into conference committee to get those boiled down to what we're going to send to the to ex governor. To explain, when you hear that word targets, those people out there are thinking, what are those targets? <laughs> targets are the They're amount stores, of, for one thing, but uh, <laughs> they're the amount of money that right. each finance bill is the upper limit they can spend, that target. Yeah, right. Uh, given uh, some change in leadership uh, in the bodies this year, 
Uh, what's your read on how the leadership is speaking to one another across the aisle? Some sense of harmony? I think there is. Yes. I, I think you're, you're seeing a much more common process mm -hmm. uh, and a much more amazing. I think people are talking together, and I think I actually think the governor is probably more engaged. Well, he was more engaged uh, in this process this time than he was in the in the past. I think so, and I think our leader in the Senate, uh, Senate Majority Leader Paul Gazelka, mm -hmm. has a very gentlemanly way. Um, he has reached out frequently and often, just getting to know the governor, talking with each other without a bill in front of him, talk about what each person cares about, what's most important. Building relationships is very important in the legislature, and I think uh, Speaker Dowd as well, uh, us as committee, uh, those of us as committee chairs as well, reaching out and working hard to build that relationship bodes well so far. I, th I think you'll find, and that's a very true statement, Senator Kip Myers. It's, this is all about relationships, and if if you're uh, if you're slinging a lot of mud, you're not going to have a whole lot of relationships, and you're gonna, you're going to find the road a little, little tougher going. Uh, so it's that relationship building over time to make sure that uh, even though you may disagree, at least you can work something in there to maybe find a, a common common thread to move to move things along. We've got our minute left here, and what I'm going to do here is with Senator Kiffmeyer first, and then with Representative Howe. Uh, when the numbers come out on the 28th, are we going to see a lot of smiles or a couple of frowns? Well, I would say in this particular year, um, the educated guess is it's not going to vary much from the current projected $1.4 billion surplus. Same track? I, I believe we're going to be right in there someplace. Yeah. I don't think it's going to change a whole lot. Very good. Thank you so much. Short staff this week, but glad you're here. Absolutely. Glad we have with here. us uh, this, we have had with us tonight Senator Mary Kiffmeyer from Big Lake and Representative uh, Jeff Howe from Rockville, right down the road on beautiful 23, a busy highway, I might end. We can talk about transportation next time, right? I'd love to. <laughs> All right. Thank you, vis uh, visitors, viewers, for joining us tonight here on Your Legislators. Next week, Barry Anderson is back. Thank you for joining us tonight, and have a good evening. There's much more about Your Legislators online at pioneer.org slash yourlegislators. Find out more about the history of the program, who has been a guest, and watch past episodes and discussions by topic. There's also a photo gallery, informative links, and much more. To continue the conversation, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you for watching Your Legislators. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of Southern Minnesota Beet Sugar Cooperative, a highly sustainable shareholder-driven cooperative that safely produces, processes, and markets sugar while being environmental stewards to ensure future opportunities for its shareholders, employees, and surrounding communities. Additional support by MAPE members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans. And by Ask Me Council 5, a union of 43,000 members who advocate for excellence in public services, dignity in the workplace, and opportunity and prosperity for all working families. <laughs>